Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Last August, Tony Barber published in the Financial Times an article about the events marking the beginning of the political and economic transition in Central and Eastern Europe. And I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Mr. Barber wrote there. If someone had predicted to me at the start of 1989 that all these events would come to pass, I would have been tempted to ask what they were smoking. It was indeed a turning point in our history. 25 years ago, it became possible for Poland and its neighbors to start building democracy and a market economy. At today's conference, we will speak about why and how it was possible for this to happen. We will also try to find out what lessons from the transition can be drawn for the future. It is clear to me that what the economies in transition share is the aim to catch up with the living standards of the advanced market economies. Notwithstanding this common objective, the experience of the transition countries in the region has varied. As Robert Solow said in 1991, there is not some glorious theoretical synthesis of capitalism that you can write down in a book and follow. You have to grope your way after the fall of the Soviet bloc, countries from Central and Eastern Europe have been designing and constructing from the ground up their own market economies, remaining under the influence of a unique set of factors of an economic, political, and social nature. I would like to refer today to the factors that, in my opinion, were important for the Polish transformation, namely the economic strategy, the political determination, and finally, the people. Let's start with the strategy. First of all, I would like to underline the importance of having a clear strategy. In Poland in 1989, the first democratically elected government faced the challenge of designing a strategy leading to the creation of a market economy. The obstacles to achieving this aim, inherited from the communist past, were huge. A severe crisis of public finance, overburdened with subsidies, inflation bordering on hyperinflation, shortages of goods, an enormous foreign debt, a collapsing balance of payments, and low productivity, the worst of all worlds. The Polish government decided to implement a strategy of rapid and comprehensive reforms, later recognized as the so-called shock therapy. Its advocates argued that in order to establish normal market conditions and restart economic growth, reforms co composed of three essential elements, price liberalization, stabilization, and privatization, had to be undertaken as quickly as possible. The program incorporating strategy based on these three elements was launched in January 1990. It was a tough austerity program there were adverse results at first. Inflation of over 100% during the first two months of implementation, a drop in production and consumption, and slightly later, a rise in unemployment, which remained very high for years. But first positive results appeared relatively soon. They included the elimination of demand-driven inflation and equilibration of the market, promotion of exports, and stimulation of private entrepreneurship. The initial rapid internal changes helped to activate the determinants of long-term development, including those of an external character. In this regard, the activation of trade played a major role in reinvigorating the economy. One of the core elements of the success of the Polish transition during the last 25 years have also been a relatively stable and a consistent macroeconomic policy. With changing economic reality, monetary policy had to evolve rapidly and build up its credibility at the same time. And it did. Gradual liberalization of the exchange rate policy took the Polish Zwoty all the way from a fixed peg through a crawling corridor towards the free float. 
The responsible way in which this process was conducted stabilized the macroeconomic environment and developed the shock absorbing capacity of the Zwote, which was successfully tested with the crisis in late 2008. One of the signs of stability provided by the economic policy has been lower inflation volatility than in most peer countries. Moreover, fiscal policy was also generally more prudent than in other transition countries. No major imbalances have been allowed to accumulate, secured or strengthened by constitutional provision. Public debt to GDP ratio has never exceeded 60%, while private indebtedness has also been kept sustainable, which, also, which can also be attributed to the traditional and conservative banking sector. And the current account deficit has never become excessive. The institution building and structural reforms carried out in the 90s were perhaps less spectacular than the macro stabilization Big Bang, but were implemented in a consistent way. Step by step, we adopted anti-monopoly policies, among others, established the, the stock exchange and other institutions of, uh, of capital market, and introduced a variety of privatization schemes. We made some mistakes, but they were corrected in a pragmatic way. One example. In the early 90s, a number of state-owned and private commercial banks faced a solvency crisis caused by a large share of non-performing loans that were not paid back by unviable companies. For the state-owned banks, the government helped with rehabilitation and recapitalization. They were recapitalized with long-term treasury bonds so that they could write off bad loans. They were able to clean up their credit portfolio, which was necessary to prepare them for privatization. Nobody remembers this exercise anymore. Everybody talks about Swedish big success of the same period. Ours was bigger in relation to the GDP. But of course, Poland was smaller then. In the mid-90s, incentives to attract foreign direct investments began to, be, began to bring positive results. All in all, by the end of the 90s, we managed to set up the solid institutional foundations for future gains from our increasingly open and competitive economy. Now let's turn to the political dimension of economic transition. In democratic systems, politicians are in the hands of the voters. In order not to lose public support, they usually prefer to speak about the bright future than about painful transition strategies. But sometimes, with regard to certain fundamental policy goals, an agreement between parties can be reached. And let me just mention two, in my opinion, most important forces that united Poland to support the pains of transition. The one was the solidarity movement and the events of 1989, the round table, the round table negotiations, partially democratic elections. The people were delighted with the new democracy and besides, there was nothing to look back and long for in the past. The past was basically merely repugnant. So the Poles were reunited in looking to the future. Bad experience of command economy helped, in a sense, politically, to garner support. And second thing is the power of the European integration process. For Poland, the aim of becoming a member of the EU, it was not called EU at that time, was of great importance. It meant reunification of Europe, return to European democratic values. Ultimately, it is to lead to better living standards. Over those 25 years, all political forces shared and supported the idea of EU membership. And this provided for continuity in macroeconomic policy. We changed prime minister, we changed uh, prime ministers, we changed finance ministers even more frequently, but the policy was broadly uh, put, uh, continued. Then the people. And I, 
I don't have in mind here the people like Lech Wałęsa, Václav Havel, Jego Gaidar, Leszek Balcerowicz, Aleksander Kwaśniewski or Tadeusz Mazowiecki. No doubt, they were indispensable. But I have in mind the people as a society. Polish society had two important features that constituted the core of transition. Support for democracy, innate support for democracy, we like to say, and capitalist traditions. Poland has democratic traditions that date back to the Middle Ages. At least this is what we like to say. But true, there was no problem in convincing Poles to become Democrats and to live in democracy. With regard to capitalist traditions, they, date, they dated from before World War II. So there were many points of reference in the process of building the structures of a free market in the early 90s. Commercial laws could be adopted on the basis of Polish pre-World War, pre War II laws. Moreover, in Poland there was a vibrant shadow economy. Even in uh, command economy, under communist rules, uh, uh, we had um, a relatively uh, skilled entrepreneurial workforce. And 10% of non-agricultural product, GDP, was created in that private initiative, as we used to call it, shadow or semi-shadow economy. So these were strong pillars of economic and political development throughout, or at least at the beginning of those 25 years. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you agree with me that a well-designed economic strategy supported by politicians and by society is the key element of transition. However, you would also agree with Winston Churchill's word, words. He said, however beautiful the strategy, you should occasionally look at the results. So let me therefore Look at the results in a nutshell. Well, between 1991 and 2013, GDP per capita increased from 32 to 62% of the EU15 average. It now stands at almost 70% of the EU28 average. Moreover, the last 25 years have seen a major structural shift in the Polish economy. Back in 1990, 28% of the working population was employed in agriculture. This share has decreased by half so far. Services have gained importance in absorbing the labor force, increasing its share from 36 to almost 60% of total employment. Massive adjustment have also taken place in Poland's formerly overgrown industrial sector. The private sector employs now more than 75% of the working population, up from 50% in 1990. This share is higher than in France, the Netherlands, or the Nordic countries. Private enterprises are particularly successful in exploring new export markets and com competing in an international environment. What lies behind the success? Stable macroeconomic environment, persistent restructuring, and finally, Poland's attractiveness to foreign investors. This stems, the latter stems from the well-educated labor force, low labor costs, and rather high labor market flexibility, both in terms of employment and wages. And of course, I could not mention, I could not, I, I have to mention the experience the expansion of exports. While most West European countries have been losing their market shares in world exports, Poland has doubled it over the last two decades. What is especially worth emphasizing it is the increasing technology content of exports. High and medium technology intensive exports account for almost half of its total value. As a matter of fact, this doubling of export share of Poland in the world uh, market is entirely due for, uh, to the increase in competitiveness. We are trading with less dynamic regions than on average. So it's not 
the case that we export to especially to, 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 to the rising stars of the, uh, of the world economy. Second, we trade in rather traditional or low-growing uh, goods and services. So this does not carry us forward, neither. It's the competitiveness. So we have carved out a bigger share in the global markets due entirely to our increased competitiveness. Well, having reached the status of an upper middle income country, a new overriding objective is to progress to the top class. We aspire to the status of an advanced economy. It, in essence, it means that our challenge is to switch from the growth model based on capital accumulation and lower labor costs towards an innovation-driven one. According to the World Bank and IMF studies, the main obstacles on this way are an inefficient institutional setup combined with unfavorable demographics and low human capital, which leads to a low level of innovation in the economy. So, this can uh, lead some people in Poland to say, well, 25 years have been a huge success, but we are in a corner. What comes next? We don't know. How to, how to bring about this next step of, of advancement from a relatively high-income country to an advanced economy stage? This is a problem. Well, let me now divert from the text, which is dangerous for my colleagues, of course. Usually we, we say how much we have to do to uh, improve the environment for innovation. And we properly, properly uh, lament about the low level of uh, public services, um, legal framework that is not uh, propitious for innovation and risk taking, fully agree. But on the other hand, we know that innovation is a painful process. It's much easier not to innovate, to replicate, rather than innovate. And to be stimulated to innovate, your life shouldn't be too easy. Is the life of Polish entrepreneurs so difficult, as they say, as we sometimes agree with this? I beg to differ. Poland has a fantastic, splendid economic location for doing business. Poland has low taxation. Poland has undervalued Zwoty. Poland has a big popular tolerance for interpreting laws in favor of entrepreneurs, even if we see dif dif difficulties and if we see cases of, uh, to the, to the, to the, um, uh, to the, um, mm, to the contrary. Thank you very much. It's my first deputy. Uh, but uh, isn't it so that in such a propitious environment, the need to innovate is reduced. Just think about it. Well, the other great challenge for further growth is related to demographic changes. I'm not going to elaborate on this. Of course, you know how to deal with it, or nobody knows really how to deal with it. Dear colleagues, I'm not going to continue with this uh, introductory remarks, leaving the floor to David Lipton, who was a uh, participant of this early heroic stage of reforms in the early 90s, or late 80s even. And he can share with you his personal experience and personal, uh, let's say, um, remarks about how Poland has changed due to his, to his knowledge, how the whole region has changed. So we know that we have achieved a lot. We know that it's, a lot is to be done. 
and the second part is maybe even more difficult. But we have a good meeting with uh, very competent, experienced people to try to draw lessons for the future from our past successes. Thank you very much.